In Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 9, God says this. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. And if you look at the second half of verse 11, he says, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. You see, when God says something, it's absolutely certain and sure as if it had already happened. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, having read that, look with me for a minute at Hebrews 11. We're talking about the certainty of what God promises, of what God says. He says, if I purpose it, I'm going to do it. If I say it, it's going to come to pass. Now, as we think about that, there's so many things in the Word of God that he has said. So many promises that he's made. As Peter was writing, he said, you know, we've got exceeding great and precious promises. Amen. And we need to be persuaded of those things. They're not suggestions. They're not something that if everything looks good, if God's having a good day, that it's going to come to pass. But he said, if I've said it, if I've purposed it, it's going to happen. And he said, I knew what's going to be from the very beginning. Amen. And I bring it to pass. So if God said it, He's going to bring it to pass. Now, as we're looking here in Hebrews chapter 11, you know how it begins. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, what God is saying is if you can believe it, it's going to happen. That was pretty weak. If you can believe it, it's going to happen. Come on. Jesus said all things are possible to him that believes, right? He said that. So if you can believe it, it's going to happen because faith is the substance. Now, something that's substance is something you can grab hold of, right? This, this podium has substance. And the Bible says that faith is that substance of the things that you're hoping for. So if you can believe it, it puts substance behind what you are hoping for, and it's going to come to pass. That's what the Bible says. And we keep reading, it says, for by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were made not, or not made, of things which do appear. Isn't it interesting? You know, we, we have scientists doing all manner of experiments to try to determine how things came to be. And they have all kinds of ideas about how this happened. And, and, you know, we talk about the Big Bang and we talk about all this other stuff. And they build these tremendous devices like the Hadron Collider and, and all these other gadgets to accelerate particles to certain high velocities so that when they encounter other particles, they'll break down into smaller particles. And hopefully we can find the God particle, the particle that caused everything to be. Well, you know, one of these days, science is going to catch up with the Bible. Amen. Because we already know where the God particle is. Amen. His name is Jesus Amen. because by him were all things made, and without him was nothing made that was made. Amen. And that's just what this says. It says, by our faith, we understand that all of creation was framed by the word of God, and the things which are seen were not made of things which appear. In other words, what was created was created out of things that you and I can't see. It was created out of the word of God. God said, let there be, and there was. Yes. So faith is substance. When God spoke, he knew something would happen. And because he did, it came into being. The faith of God. The Bible tells us to have the faith of God. How do you get the faith of God? You ask for it. Because faith is a gift of the Spirit. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Or 12 or 14. Just anywhere in there you want to look. Talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Talking about love. Now, let's think a little bit. By faith. And it begins to talk about all the people that did awesome things because of their faith. 
And we read Hebrews 11, and man, we say, man, that's the Hall of Fame. That's, you know, that's like you have to be somebody pretty awesome to get in there. And we get down to Abraham in verse 8. And it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and went out not knowing where he went. And by faith, he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, little tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Verse 11, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. That all sounds really good. But now let's think for a minute about Abraham and Sarah. We think that these people were super saints that got into this chapter. We think that they must have faith beyond all comprehension. But let's think about Abraham for a minute. When Abraham, the one thing I believe that, that got favor in God's eyes with Abraham was that when God spoke to him and said, come with me somewhere, Abraham went. He did. He stepped out in faith, as we would say today. Now, I don't know how God appeared to him. I don't know if he came in a dream. I don't know if he came in a vision. I don't know if an audible voice spoke. I don't know if he had a theophany, as they, they say, where God appears. I don't know if, how it worked. I don't know if it was just a voice in his mind that said, let's do this, and he responded. But because he responded, God chose him to be the one through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed and chose him to be the father of the people that God said, those are the people that if you bless, I'll bless you, and if you curse them, I'll curse you. I don't know if it's because he's the only man that when God spoke to him and said, come with me, decided to go or not. The Bible doesn't go into that. But it just says that when God spoke to him and said, come with me, he went. So that was, that, was, that was faith. But then you follow his life and you see things that just aren't faith at all. Like when he, when he, when he gets into the, uh, the land of promise and he decides to go down into Egypt. And he says, well, now, hey, you tell the king that you're talking about his wife. Tell him you're my sister because they'll kill me for you because you're a pretty foxy woman. <laughs> well, you know, something like that. <clears throat> Lied like a big dog, you know? That's not much of an act of faith, is it? But you know what? God blessed in such a way that he prevented anything happening with the king when he took Sarah to be his wife. And he also warned that you better not do this because this is my person. And when he turned him loose, God blessed, and God even blessed Abraham and Sarah. Now, how in the world could God bless somebody doing that. Well, you keep going. And he does it again. And you keep going and God promises something to him. And he says, listen, I know you're dead with old age and you got one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. You didn't read that version. Well, you know, <laughs> something akin to that. God said, I realize that you are old and your wife is old and she's barren, but you're going to have a son. Well, what did Abraham do? He cracked up. He said, you're right. <laughs> what did Sarah do? Same thing. She cracked up. She didn't believe a word of it. Is that faith? No, it's not. But you know what? God was faithful to what he promised, even though they weren't walking in faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Hebrews says that, faith, that through faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, how did she get to this faith after she cracked up when God told her that she was going to have a child? Something had to happen in the interim, didn't it, that caused her to have faith? Well, I can't tell you exactly what that was, but I can give you a couple of ideas what it might have been. From the, between the time that God came, God, in fact, God came twice. He, he came to Abraham and he said, I'm going to give you a son. And some short time later, he and two angels came and visited and said, this time next year, Sarah's going to have a son. That's when she was in the tent door behind him, sniggering and saying, yeah, right, like that's going to happen. And of course, a year later, 
or at the appointed time within the right amount of time, she, of course, had a son. But what happened between the time when she's laughing because she didn't believe it and the time that, as Hebrews says, she had the faith to conceive? What happened in that interim? Well, I can't tell you for sure, but I can give you a couple of ideas. During that interval of time, between the moment that God spoke to her and she laughed in unbelief and the time that she had the child, a couple of things happened. One of them was that God met with Abraham and told him what he was about to do. He said, the sin of Sodom has come to the point that I can no longer look over it. And I'm going down into Sodom and we're going to find out if it's as it's been told to me. And if it is, it's going to be destroyed. Well, Abraham knew Lot was there. And Abraham, as you know the story, began to intercede for Lot. And he began to say, God, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And what if there's 40, you know, 30, 20, et cetera, et cetera, it gets down to 10. And God says, for the sake of 10, I will spare the place. Well, as you remember, he couldn't find 10. So the angels went in and they brought out Lot and, and his two daughters and his wife. And the Bible says in the morning, Abraham got up to the place where he stood before God and he looked over the valley and he said, the smoke went up like a furnace. Now, Abraham did not know whether or not Lot had survived. But Abraham saw that what God said had certainly come to pass. And I don't know if that's what produced the faith in Sarah or not, but let me read this to you. It says, when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. That's from Isaiah 26. I don't know if that's what did it or not. I don't know. And you know, Lot was spared. I, I don't know if that was the thing that produced the faith, seeing God do exactly what he said and doing it quickly. I don't know if it was that or if maybe in a short period of time he found out that Lot had survived. I don't know. I don't know when he found that out or even if he did. We don't know because we know that when Lot came out of Sodom, he and his daughters went up into the hills into a cave. And I don't know how long they stayed there. But something got a hold of Abraham and Sarah and caused them to believe that what God said would come to pass. Maybe it was standing on that hill and looking down in that valley where God had said, you know, I'm going to judge this city and watching the smoke go up. I don't know. I don't know if it was because seeing God's righteous judgment brought a fear of unbelief in their heart and they believed with all their heart. And because of that, their son was born. I don't know. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you this. When God says it, it's going to come to pass. Amen. When God tells something in his word, we can, we can take it to the bank, as the old expression is. Now, what's all that got to do with anything? This right here. God said, it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will see visions. Or vice versa. One of the two. Anyway, we're going to have something going on. Right? God said he's going to pour out his spirit in the last days. We're in the last days. God's going to pour out his spirit. Amen. Why? Because he said, consider the old things. Remember what we read when we first started there? Let me read that to you again. He said, remember the former things of old, for I'm God, there's none else. I'm God, and there's none like me. Well, what former things do we need to remember? We need to remember all the times that he told somebody something that was going to happen, and it came to pass. We need to remember when he told Abraham, yes, you're 99 years old. Your wife is 89, 90 years old. You know, you're, there's no way that this can happen because I, but I've told you it's going to happen and it will happen and it did happen. We need to remember those former things. We need to remember when God spoke to Joshua and said, when you come to the city of Jericho, this is what you're going to do. You're going to march around it. You're not going to shoot an arrow into it. You're not going to throw a spear into it. You're not going to bring a, a ram against the gates. You're not going to build up a ramp to where you can cross over the walls. You're going to march around it. You're going to blow shofars. And on that last day, on that seventh time around, you're going to shout, and I'm going to cause the walls to fall down flat. That's what he promised. And that's what he did. We've got to remember that when God says it, it's going to come to pass. Amen. Now, remember. Faith is substance. 
Faith causes things to come into existence. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that if you, that if you start believing and claiming it, there's a new Cadillac going to materialize in your driveway. It might. <laughs> I don't know. That's not what God's got in mind. His, his, his promise to you is not so that you can live and imagine. His promise to you is not so that you can have a tremendously opulent lifestyle in this world. But his promise is so that you'll believe his promise. If you'll believe his promise, he will bring to pass what he's promised in this world. He'll bring to pass revival. He'll bring to pass repentance. He'll bring to pass salvation. He will cause a tremendous move of his spirit if we'll just believe and cry out to him for it. Daniel is such a tremendous example. There in Babylonian captivity, been there since he was a young man, and now he's old and gray-headed, and he's studying the word of God, and he sees the promise. He sees, he understands, he's reading the scroll of Jeremiah, and he sees where God says, this is what's going to happen. Yes, you're going down into captivity. Yes, these, these years will have to transpire, but I am promising you that you're coming out of captivity. I'm promising you that the temple will be rebuilt. I'm promising you that Jerusalem will be restored. And Daniel sees it. He begins to pray and he begins to cry out to God. And he says, Lord, I am coming to you because you're a merciful God. Our sins are tremendous. They mount up to heaven. We have disobeyed. We've turned our backs. We've been hard-hearted. We've done everything in the world imaginable against you. We have walked away from you. But God, I see the promise. And I'm embracing this promise, and I'm claiming this promise, and I'm crying out to you, God, in mercy, in mercy restore. And, of course, God brings it to pass. Why? Because God said it would happen. And if God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh in the last days, it's going to happen. And, folks, we need to be claiming that promise. We need to be believing that promise. We need to be pursuing that promise. Because an outpouring of his spirit is the only salvation this nation has. It doesn't matter. Well, let me rephrase that. It does matter who we put in the White House, but whoever we put in the White House can't save the nation. Whoever we put in as a Supreme Court justice can't save the nation. Whatever party has majority in, in, our, in our government can't save the nation. The only thing that can save the nation is the same thing that transformed this nation twice before, the first or second great outpouring. The first outpouring, the first great awakening caused this nation to be birthed. The second great awakening caused such a movement that, that, that God caused the, those, those original states to solidify and brought us through hard times. The, the awakenings around the world have transformed the lives of people. Wales was, was, a, was a perfect example when God moved in, in such a way that people in the, in the coal mines and people in the bars and people in their homes suddenly, instantly came under conviction and fell on their face and began to cry out to God. Hundreds of people would go to the police stations and say, what do we do? And the police had to call for, for pastors and had to call for members of churches to come and minister to these people. And churches were packed out because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit that came on the place. Amen. That's what will save this nation. And God will do it if we will believe it and if we'll cry out to him. God's promise is still certain and it's sure. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from heaven and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. The only thing that will save this nation is an appeal to heaven. An appeal to heaven. John Locke was writing in, in, in some of his political treatises and, and, and he was talking about what happens in the affairs of men and the affairs of government. And he said, when you've exhausted every resource, when you've tried every legal avenue to try to rectify a situation between an opposing government and a, and a populace that's being uh, you know, put under an iron fist, he said, the only thing that you have left is an appeal to heaven. And that's how this country was birthed. That's what was on the flag that George Washington had flying over the ships of his little microscopic navy. It was a flag that said an appeal to heaven. And what happened? God heard and God moved. And he'll do it again. He'll do it again. What we have to do is appeal to heaven. We have to cry out to him. But we have to do it in faith because we have to remember what he's done in times past. We have to remember the old things as he said here. And we have to remember that he is God and there is none else. But he's all we need. 
because he's able to do more than we can even ask or think. Listen to it again. Remember the former things of old. For I'm God and there's none, none else. I'm God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God's going to do what he promised. We've just got to believe it. And we've got to press towards it. And we've got to ask for it. But he'll do it because he said it. His word is certain and it's sure. And it's going to come to pass. He did it for Daniel. He did it for people that were so undeserving. And you know, so many times we say America's gone too far. This nation is too far from God. We, we think about all the things that have taken place. We think about all the precious babies that have been sacrificed on the altar of abortion. We think about the, the, the fact that our highest court basically nullifies what traditional marriage, what God says a marriage is. We think about, you know, we've come so far that, that you know, people don't know what restroom to use. I mean, for crying out loud. We, we, we're moving this way and this way. And as we look at it, we say America's gone too far. But let me tell you this. God's word has not changed. Amen. And if he said, I will pour out my spirit in the last days, he's going to pour out his spirit. Amen. And you know what? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God says, listen, I am more desirous to forgive than to punish. And if you'll turn back to me, then I'll forgive. And the sin that you've committed, I'll remember no more. And if God will pour out his spirit and there'll be a tremendous repentance in this country, and that's the only thing that can bring it, God will forgive. God will forgive because he's done it time and time again. I think about Nineveh, a, a, a city that should have been wiped off the face of the earth because of the atrocities which they committed. They hated Jews beyond all things, and they made, they made uh, bonfires of, of their bodies. They had heaps of heads that had been severed from the Jewish people. They loved, you know, the, the leaders, the rulers of Nineveh loved to torture Jewish people. Uh, along their streets, they would have poles, and they would fashion the bodies of uh, fasten the bodies of Jewish people to these poles and soak them in some kind of flammable material and set them on fire and light the streets with the burning Jewish people. But that same city, that same city that most of the world would have rejoiced if God had done with them as he did with Sodom, when Jonah walked into the city and began to proclaim the word of God and they repented, God spared them. God spared them. He spared them for at least 200 years. <clears throat> Eventually, because of their wickedness, they were destroyed. But God spared them for at least 200 years. God will do the same for us. When he pours out his spirit, and there's a repentance, and there's a turning back to God, God is a merciful, long-suffering God. And God longs to forgive, and God longs to restore so don't throw up your hands. Don't say there's no hope for this nation because he is the God of hope. God of hope, and he wants to fill us with hope. But we have to believe his word. We have to see what he's done in times past. And we have to cling to that promise, and we have to cry out and say, God, I see it right here, and I'm not going away until I see it come to pass. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. We're too quick to faint. We as Christians, we, we look at the immensity of the sin of our nation. We look at the, the degradation that's taking place around us. And we see it bigger than we see the God that we serve. But let me tell you something. All the wrong in this nation is not bigger than the God that we serve. God can save. God can turn the course. God can change the direction of the heart of the king. If my people will pray. Why does he say that? Because when we pray, the only way that we can get an answer is if we believe. Because faith is substance. So when we come, we have to pray in faith. And we have to pray believing. And how can we pray in faith? Well, one way is to do what he said. Remember the former things. Talk about what God's done before. One of the greatest things to build faith in you is to sit down and begin to read the history of the revivals in this nation. Read about the Great Awakening in New England. Read about Cane Ridge. 
Read about all these things that has taken place as people of God cried out to him and came together and saw his face and God poured out revival. Read about the revival in Wales. Read about the revival in different places in this world and see what God can do. Remember those things and begin to claim that for this nation. God's not finished with us. He's able to do more than we can ask or think. Don't give up. Don't throw up your hands and say, we've gone too far. Because, folks, listen, until that trumpet sounds, until he calls us home, until we're taken out of this world, God is still expecting you and I to stand in the gap and to intercede and to cry out to him on behalf of this land. And he says, you call and I'll answer. God is going to move as surely as we're in this room today. Remember the former things. Think about it and encourage yourself. Believe the promise of God when he says, I've spoken it and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it and I will also do it. Remember that. Remember, it doesn't take a super saint. You don't have to be a, a candidate for the Hall of Fame of Faith to have God move. Because, you see, as he said, he said, I see the end from the beginning. You know, when, when Abraham was, was going through all those things, it looked pretty, pretty, pretty shady. It looked pretty shaky for him. But God knew how he was going to end up. Remember what God said just before he brought down all that destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah? He said, I know him. And I know how he's going to order his family so that I can fulfill my word. God could look down through time and see what would happen as he interacted with Abraham. And God looks down through time and he sees what can happen when you and I will do what he's called us to do. When we'll believe and when we'll pray and cry out to him and seek him with all our heart. You see, before God ever brought America or the United States into existence, he knew what would happen. He knew exactly about the condition that we're in today. And yet he still brought us into existence. He, he knew what would happen when we were birthed. He knew how that we would begin to send the word of God around the world. He knew that we'd be a nation that would reach out to other nations and help them in time of trouble like no other nation ever has. He knew that. He also knew that the time would come when we'd begin to turn away from him. But he still brought us into existence. And folks, I believe this. I believe he's carried us too far to throw us out now. Amen. God has a plan. And that plan is an outpouring of his spirit. So we need to cry out to God and say, Lord, do it now. Because I see it in your word just as Daniel did. Lord, I see it. It's here. It's here in this holy word of God. And Lord, I believe it. So I'm asking you to do it because of your mercy and your grace, not because of who we are or what we've done. And we see this promise in his word today. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. If we see it in that word, we need to begin to believe it and claim it. Cry out to God, fulfill your word, Father. Not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of your mercy and your amazing grace. Never give up. He's still on the throne. He's still God. And his word is still certain and sure. And if he says it, he'll bring it to pass. I want to ask you to do something this morning. I want to ask you to stand. Everyone that will, let's come and let's, let's stand in the altar for a minute. And let's acknowledge the fact that his word is certain. Let's acknowledge the fact that he is still on the throne. Let's acknowledge the fact that if he said it, he's going to bring it to pass. Let's acknowledge the fact that these are the last days and he's promised to pour out his spirit. Let's ask him to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. God, I thank you that there is hope in this dark world. God, I thank you that there's hope in the word of God because you are the God of hope. And Lord, as, as Paul was praying, he was praying that the God of hope would fill us with hope because the Bible says that we're saved by hope. And God, if we come to a place where we have no hope, then, we're, then we've had it. There's, there's nothing else. But Lord, we have hope today because we look in your word and we see a promise. 
And we also look in your word and we see that you said, if I said it, I'll bring it to pass. And if I purposed it, I will make it happen. So God, you said it in your word. And like Daniel, in, in the midst of a dark hour of this nation, in the midst of a time when it seems everything is lost because we have, we've turned so far from you and we've embraced so many things that are wicked and vile and things that your word condemns. We've done so much in, in, in the name of acceptance and in the name of not offending anybody that, Lord, we've offended you and you are the one who matters. So, God, today as we stand in this holy place, we ask for forgiveness. We confess our sin before you. God, we confess the, the sin that we've committed in this nation, the sin of having other gods before you. Lord, we confess the sin of, of, of abortion. We confess the sin of homosexuality. We confess the sin of, of saying evil is good and good is evil. God, we confess the sin of putting everything before you. God, we confess the sin of disobedience. We, as the church, Confess the sin of, of idleness, of doing nothing, of not standing for what we believe. We confess the sin of, of being at ease in Zion. We confess the sin of unbelief. God, we repent. We repent, Lord. And God, I pray that this day, that this day, we would enter into covenant with you and say, Lord, we will. We will do what you've called us to do. We will humble ourselves before you and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. We're not talking about the nation. We're not talking about those that don't know Jesus. We're not talking about those that are lost. We're talking about believers. God, we want to turn from our wicked ways. And you know what they are in every one of our lives. But God, we covenant with you today to turn and repent. Humble ourselves and seek your face so that you can honor your part of this covenant that says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive the sin and heal the land. God, we covenant with you today. We covenant with you today because we see a promise in your word as we reflect on those things of old, on, on Abraham and Sarah, on Joshua, the city of Jericho, the people of Jerusalem, uh, the people of Israel. God, as, as we look at all the things you've done in your word when you promised it and it came to pass, Lord, we look at all the prophecies that Messiah fulfilled when he came on the scene. We look at all these things and we realize if you say it, it's going to happen. And we see it, Lord. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. We see it. And we claim it today. And in faith we say, do it now, Lord. These are the last days. God, this country is in desperate need. Lord, we need revival. We need a wave of repentance. We need conviction of the Holy Spirit in the church and in the streets. God, hear us from heaven today. We're appealing to heaven because you are our recourse. You're our last resort. And God, as your people stand here in this altar, and we come together with one heart and one voice to say, God, hear us. Hear us from heaven. Forgive our sin and heal our land. God, we believe that you will because you're a God of covenant. You're a God that does what you say, and you'll bring it to pass. So, Father, I'm praying for these that are gathered here this morning and anyone that's listening in any way. I pray for hope to rise up within them. I pray for faith to rise up within them. And, God, I pray that you will give us that gift of faith that you promised through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, give us that gift of faith that we can pray a prayer of faith and see the answer. Lord, whether it be to see the sick healed or whether it be to see the lost saved or whether it be to see this nation change course. But, Lord, the word says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So, God, give us the ability to pray that effectual fervent prayer. Give us the ability to pray a prayer of faith. 
And God let faith rise up and let hope rise up. And God let us be that people of hope that go forth from this place and bring hope and not despair. God, I pray that every situation that we enter into, we would not begin to list the negative side, but we'd begin to describe how great our God is. Lord, as we look at the nation around us and we see the sin and we see the inept abilities of, of those that are in authority, it would appear. God, I pray that whenever we get into a discussion about any of that, we wouldn't begin to list all the problems, but we'd begin to say, yes, but there is a God on the throne of heaven, and the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and like a river of water, he turns it wheresoever he will. God, I pray that we would begin to declare the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the promise of God. God, we would begin to speak those words that would bring hope and bring life because we are supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. God, we've allowed the church to lose its saltiness because we've become so enamored with the things of the world and we've allowed so much of the world to infiltrate our thinking and our, and our actions. But God, today we repent and I pray that you'd restore our saltiness. God, I pray that you'd restore our light. God, I pray that we'd shine in the darkness and we'd bring hope so that the darkness would have to recede and people would look at us and they'd begin to see the fact that we are living in hope, that we have the joy of the Lord, and they'll be drawn to that and say, how can you hope in a situation like this? And we can say, because of this, we can give an answer for the hope that's within us. So, Father, for these that are gathered here, for those that are listening, I pray that hope would arise. I pray that faith would arise. I pray that the joy of the Lord would arise. And, Lord, that we would be bearers of hope. And, Lord, because of that light that's shining in us, multitudes would be drawn to the light. Father, I thank you. And I praise you this morning that you're the God that knows the end from the beginning. You're the God that says it and brings it to pass. You're the God that purposes it, you, and it will be accomplished. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray for every need that's represented here this morning. And, Lord, I know that you're the answer to everyone. Lord, whether it be physical healing, Lord, whether it be a, a, a restoration of the joy of the Lord, whether it be circumstances, situations, relationships, whatever it is, you're the answer. So, God, I pray that the great I am would move in every life this day and bring whatever's needed because your promise is my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise. So, Lord, help us to remember faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let us be a people of faith and hope. And God, let us change the world around us as you work through us, answering the promise in your word as your people call. Father, I ask you to bless each one of these. Thank you for this time together today. Our eyes are on you, and we know that you will come, you'll come through because that's who you are. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.